All right. I'm going to ask again. I hope I hear, I hear a, hey, good cheers. Um, hey there, Ricon. How's it going? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Cool. So I don't know if you can tell, but I'm actually freaking out right now. Uh, so if I, uh, you know, do say something that doesn't make any sense, just like, you know, play it cool. At least give me one, one shot. Um, so I'm going to talk about a uh, lot of movement today and we're going to talk about hunting for a lot of movement. So definitely a blue team talk. However, in order to hunt for a lot of movement, you really need to understand how a lot of movement works. So that is why I definitely go through red team um, and techniques and tools to really hunt for it. Um, as you can tell by my name, I'm not from around. I will get there. And as you can tell by the name of my talk, uh, I don't really have a good imagination. It, it was either this or hunting like a boss, which is a complete ripoff from uh, Rocky's talk also. Um, but I promise that the content is better than the name. <laughs> All right. So a little bit of me. I'm actually from Peru. Uh, has anyone been to Peru? Yay. Two. OK. <laughs> Fun fact about Peru. You probably didn't know this. Um, so a few thousand years ago, uh, the old Peruvians actually domesticated a poisonous root and used it a lot on their diet. Uh, we still use it a lot. And in the 1500s, uh, the Spanish came, colonized us, they took this back to Europe, and it became big in Ireland, UK, and all over Europe. I'm actually talking about potatoes. So if you guys, you know, next time that you're eating your cheeseburger and french fries or your home fries or whatever kind of way potatoes are eaten, think about Peru. That's my peeps. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm, uh, I, I lead the blue team at a financial services uh, company in New York. Uh, I started as a pen tester. And then I, five years ago, I actually moved to New York for this job. And I've been, I've been here since. It's been a, it's been a ride. Um, I have to say, when I first started doing blue, um, I always thought I was going to come back to red because I always thought it was sexier. I can tell you now, blue, blue is sexy. And, uh, yeah. That's my Twitter account. I love to connect. I love to meet this awesome community. I'm really honored and, and, uh, excited and, and afraid and frightened of being here. So all the, all the, uh, all the possible feelings I am feeling right now. Um, but yeah. So, all right. So this is the agenda. We're clearly going to talk about, um, introduction, just kind of define what a lateral movement is. We're going to go from a red team perspective, analyze the techniques and tools, then blue team, um, Focusing on event logs, uh, and then I'm gonna actually release, well not release, but show you a tool I'm gonna release in the next couple of weeks that is hopefully will be able to help you guys in your hunts for lateral movement. Alright, so let's go ahead and start. So just let's define, right, lateral movement. Um, so once an attacker has a foothold on, on your environment, either through a Server, server side attack or a client side attack or it really doesn't matter. Once they have that initial foot call, lateral movement are the techniques that enable the adversary, uh, to access and control systems on a network, right? Took this from MITRE, uh, awesome, awesome resource. So the premise is there's an initial foot call, right? Uh, and then lateral movement are techniques that enable this attacker to move around the network and look for the information that they want to go after. Lateral movement is not always required. If you think about if an attacker is only trying to go after one user's information, emails, files, whatever, that if that first fish gives you a shell, then you don't need to do anything else. That's it, right? No need to move laterally. However, most of the cases, it's not going to be like that, right? It's really unlikely for an attacker to send, you know, 100 fishes, you get a few shells. It's really unlikely for the target information that's going to be on those first 10 shells, right? So they have to go through this process of moving laterally in order to find the information they're looking for and then finally exfiltrating it, right? And I like this. I like this approach because, you know, attackers in these types of attacks, they have to move laterally. And I repeat, half. And I like this half because now this gives me the opportunity, me as a blue team, to go look for them while they're trying to do this. Now, 
ladder movement is not straightforward in the sense that it's they're not going to, on that first next hop, they're not going to find the information they're going after, right? They're going to have to initially do reconnaissance and figure out where they are and where the, serv the database servers are if they're looking for that or whatever. Uh, email servers, whatever it is that they're going after, it's going to take them some time to figure that out. If it's going to be easy for them, then you have other problems. But if they don't really know your network, they'll, it's going to take them time, right? And they initially, they're going to move laterally to hosts that they don't really care, but they don't know that because they're looking for information. So they're going to leave traces behind. And if we hunt for this, we look for them, we may find them. And that's the whole concept of this talk. I I think that um, as an industry, uh, we're and even the tools that are being sold to us, and believe me, coming from you know financial services in New York, there's a lot of tools that I get get uh, advertised every day. Every day there's emails with new tools that you know prevent all the breaches that happen every day, right? Um, so uh, I think that we are focusing too much on the left side of the attack uh, life cycle. We're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent that first um, shell. We're trying to uh, look for that first shell, but we're not trying to look for them while they're already in the network, right? So if an attacker is able to bypass those first controls on the left side of the life cycle, then it's easy for them to move laterally. No one's looking for them, right? So they're not going to be found. Um, I was talking to pen testers, um, just you know, doing more research about this talk, and they were telling me the same. Like once I have credentials, that's it. It's just a matter of time until I get to the right place and to fa and and run Mimikatz on the right place, right? So. That's my, the, the concept of my goal and my tool is, I'm not saying don't focus on the left side of things. And, uh, I'm saying, hey, balance it out a little bit. And sure, you know, let's try to prevent that initial fish, that initial shell, um, and look for them and that. But also, let's try to look them while they're already on the network, right? Let's also try to detect ongoing breaches, right? So, just to sum it up, like, why should we care? So, I need, we, I think we need to redefine, like, our goal is not to prevent that first shell, right? Our goal is to prevent exfiltration. So if we can detect lateral movement or prevent it, um, you, we win, because then you're stopping uh, exfiltration, right? This talk is about detecting lateral movement, um, um, not preventing, just to make that clear. All right, so now let's analyze things from a red team perspective. Of course, if you want to hunt for uh, lateral movement, you really need to understand how lateral movement techniques are implemented, right? So there's no way we can be good blue teamers if we don't understand the red team, right? So we have to. Uh, there's no other way. So let's try. Let's let's talk about that. Uh, about that. So there's definitely a lot of techniques out there. I want to focus on one and the most important one, which is abusing Windows legitimate Windows services features, right? And that's the common technique. Again, I was I was at the um, uh, Black Hills uh, Information Security talk, guys, and uh, they um, they mentioned right away. You know, once we're on an assessment, once we find those credentials, then that's where we start moving laterally. That's so they always using credentials. If you talked about uh, if you talk to the incident response guys, and just like here, like I, I find this main the end quote from a couple of years ago, but I think it validates what I'm trying to say that they also, they, based on all their engagements, they always see credentials being stolen 100%. And that's, that's the most common technique used for lateral movement. So that's, I want to focus on that, abusing Windows, legitimate Windows services, using credentials that you've stolen somehow, right? So we're going to focus on that. It doesn't matter how you stole the credential. I'm not going to focus on that. Let's assume that credential has been stolen, admin credentials. And then you start moving laterally by abusing Windows services. So this is the first technique, um, abusing um, Windows services, right? Um, specifically SCM, which is a service control manager, part of Windows that manages all the services, right? Um, so if you're a admin, you can actually interact with SCM through the network a couple of ways. One, RPC, so port 135. Uh, and also over SMB, which is something I didn't know until I did this research. And we'll t I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you want to do this natively, you can just use S the SC commands that are native on any Windows host to create a service and then start a service, or you can use PowerShell, uh, or there's a bunch of tools. I, this is the most common technique implemented. So PSExec, uh, Metasploit, Empire, the Impacket libraries. There's another one called PAExec that I didn't know about. 
they all implement this technique. So PSX, the way it works, it first authenticates, maps an administrator share, the admin administrator share, copies the PSX service binary to that share, and then talks to our, uh, through uh, the SEM through RPC to start the service, and then you get a shell. Uh, Metasploit does it a little bit different, and when I was doing my testing, I, I realized that once Metasploit um, drops that binary, it doesn't talk RPC at all through port 135. And I wanted to, like, I, I didn't know how he was doing it. And then I realized by looking at Wireshark that, uh, Metasploit actually uses uh, SMB only and connects through SEM through a uh, name pipe. And the name pipe is called SBCCTL. So Metasploit doesn't need RPC to be open, just 445. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting learning about that. So you can interact with SEM through RPC or SMB uh, sorry, RPC over SMB through name pipes. Uh, and then the whole concept of living of the land has been around, right? So Metasploit changed this technique and then instead of having to drop a binary, they just call a PowerShell uh, one-liner and then inject shell code and, and get a shell. So, so this applies for all the techniques that we're going to talk about. You don't really have to drop binaries anymore. You can just call PowerShell without dropping a binary. All right, so WMI, the next one. Um, Windows Management Instrumentation. Um, there's a particular class in WMI. It's called uh, Win32 underscore process. And this class allows you to uh, instantiate processes. You can interact with WMI also through the network by using uh, RPC. Um, uh, so you can natively, you can use WMIC uh, na natively on any Windows host. and Or you can use invoke WMI method uh, through PowerShell. There's also tools out there like uh, WMI exec and all all these tools that also implement this technique. Empire, crack map exec. Um, okay, the next one is uh, abusing the task scheduler. So we can interact with the task scheduler through RPC once again, and also through SMB over a name pipe. So natively, you can use AT at uh, or SEH tasks. There's a, a partial commandlet that I found. I'm not sure if it can be used remotely. I'll have to test this. Uh, there's some tools that implement this technique, not as many as the other techniques, uh, ATXEC from uh, the InPacket library, and then CrackMapExec uh, also. Oh, something interesting I found on my testing is that, uh, so at was the first uh, native Windows tool, and then ACH task came, right? So, but at, uses name pipes over SMB and SEH stats uses RPC. So I'm not sure if like the way that Microsoft wants you to do things is RPC now, because that's the new way of doing it with the SEH stats, but I thought that was interesting. All right, WinRM. Um, so Windows management, uh, Windows remote management is a Microsoft implementation of a protocol called WSMAN for management of hosts. Uh, port 5985, HTTP and HTTPS, it's a so web services uh, protocol. Uh, you can natively uh, run commands if this service is enabled by using WinRS, uh, just a command line tool it's natively or once again. Or you can use um, Met the Metasploit, uh, there's a Metasploit um, auxil auxiliary model for this. Now, by default, first of all, this service is not enabled by default. It's only, well, on Windows 2012 and above, I think it's enabled by default, but on Windows 7, for example, it's not. Uh, even if, but there's, if you have like, uh, admin credentials, you can just run one command that enables it, right? So you could enable it yourself. However, the default um, configuration of WinRM won't allow you to use the Metasploit module because it's, you have to, configure in a way that allows unencrypted connections and doesn't and, and not support Kerberos. Uh, and there's a cool uh, blog from Jason uh, Land from Trusted Tech about you know how to use uh, WinRM and PowerShell to remove move laterally. However, if you don't want to use PowerShell, you can just call this other command that just configures the WinRM service and then the Metaspell module is going to work. So you just allow an encrypted through this module here and, and the Metasploit um, module will work. There's another way of abusing WinRM um, uh, by using PowerShell remoting. So you can uh, execute PowerShell scripts remotely, once again, over WinRM. And you can do this through uh, Metasplo uh, sorry, PowerShell uh, with invoke command. And, and, and the PS session is pretty cool because it's kind of like an SSH for Windows. Once you, if you have enabled, you just, it's kind of like getting a shell. Uh, and then uh, Empire implements this technique. 
All right, so January this year, uh, Matt Nelson from uh, Spectre Ops, he uh, he posted a blog in uh, a blog post, and he figured out how to move laterally using uh, DCOM objects. So he found out three DCOM objects, uh, MMC20, Shell Windows, and Shell Browser Window, and you can interact with them through RPC um, over the network, if you're an admin. And then these are the ways that you can execute, promote, com um, code remotely through these objects um, through PowerShell. Now, last week he he tweeted about finding new ways of using these DCOM objects to move laterally by uh, also abusing the Windows suite. And he first started with Excel, but now I think Word and my PowerPoint, basically all the the Windows suite you can use. Um, so I haven't I haven't tested that yet, but that's going to be definitely the next step for me. And of course, our RDP, right, the remote desktop protocol, is something that attackers can use once they have credentials uh, to give them like an interactive uh, uh, session on the host. So at the end of this red team analysis, I just wanted to, uh, you know, print this matrix where I realized that um, the most common technique utilized by pen testing tools is services. They all do it, most of them. Um, and then uh, the task scheduler one is the least implemented, interesting enough. Uh, WMI seems out there, WinRM, I'm sure people are going to move to that, and then DCOM also. Just thought that was interesting, just an analysis of the tools that I tested. All right, so now let's move back to the other side of the fence and talk about blue team analysis. So what I wanted to do is, you know, I, had, I set up this lab environment, and I used, you know, 15, 20 tools to move laterally across the domain, and I just wanted to see how this looked like. Um, I want to focus on Windows events, right? I know there's other sources of information. I know that we could do other stuff, but I wanted to start with the simple. When we all have Windows event logs, right? It's native. So let's do that. So first of all, for all the techniques that um, I implemented and I, we talked about, they all always going to leave behind some type of authentication event, right? All of them, right? Oh, I just, the configs basically is just uh, auditing configs, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that actually. So, the first main two categories of logging that you wanna take a look at is account logon and logon logoff on a Windows domain environment. Now, the names are really confusing, but let me break it up for you. So, account logon is, means actually authentication, credential validation, and this event will happen on the host that is the owner or, I guess, authoritative for the account. So if you're using a domain account, the account login event will happen at a domain controller. But if you use a local account, the account login event will happen at that host that you're accessing. Now, the logon logoff events, they will, they will be, be logged when there's sessions being created and destroyed. And they will never happen at the domain controller. They will happen at the host that you are accessing or moving laterally to, right? So if we talk about specific events, if you're using Kerberos for account logon, you'll see a 4768 on the domain controller. If you're using um, NTLM, you'll see a 4776. As far as logon goes, the most important event ID here is 4624, which is the actual logon session when the logon session starts. Now, or, or, on this guy, 4624, it has different fields, interesting fields, but the most interesting one is one called logon type, and it has like nine different types of, of logon types. Uh, but the, the one that I've seen happen on all the lateral movement techniques that I use is uh, type 3 network. So this one will always, uh, again, going back to those five techniques that we discussed that I tested all, they always show a 4624 event, type 3. Now the other interesting one that you may want to know about is type 10, which is RDP. All Those are the only two that are used for remote authentications. All the other ones are used for um, local, some kind of local authentication, like when you're on the host itself. All right, so if you use a domain account and Kerberos authentication to move laterally on our environment, this is how it looks like. So on the domain controller, you'll see a 4768, which is the account logon. Um, uh, you'll see the name, in this case, uh, Mr. Burns. Uh, you'll see the, um, the IP address and the time. If you, and what do you see on the actual host that is the victim, right, where you're moving laterally to? You'll see again a 4624, like we talked about. Type three, always, on the, on the top right there. You'll see the user, you'll see the source IP, you also see the workstation name, but in my testing, I've, um, I've learned that this, this field doesn't really get populated all the time, and I'm not sure why. Uh, one interesting thing that you also get is a logon ID, which allows you to correlate different events, uh, through, for, for the same session. So if you're using a domain account 
and NTLM, not Kerberos, you'll see a 4776 on the domain controller, right? And if finally, if you use a local account, you won't see any logs on the domain controller. All you see is a 4776 on the local host and then a log on 4624 on that same host, nothing on the domain controller. So right away, when I, when I learned about this, this started, you know, bringing some ideas like, you can use 4776 to hunt for who's using NTLM authentication on your environment, right? I mean, you may have legacy applications, but for the most part, general users will never use NTLM. Um, anyone using pen testing tools? So I, when I was doing some tests, I, I did two types of tests, right? What, lateral movement after you had a shell on a host and move laterally from that shell, like a pivot. Or a lot of moving directly from a Kali Linux directly to a host. So if kind of like as if you had like a like a physical access to the network, right? When you're doing that physical access where Metasploit is connecting directly to the victim or all the other tools, not only Metasploit, but the ones that I tested, you always see NTLM authentication. So Kerberos doesn't support, uh, sorry, Metasploit doesn't support Kerberos. And that's why you will see a 4776. So it could be interesting to hunt for this event. Uh, I'm gonna, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to skip stuff because I'm uh, running out of time. Um, maybe I can go back to it if we have time. Uh, all right, so system event. So this is really one really good uh, event. Um, so when a service is created, you can, the, a log is generated. And this is on the category of uh, system on the Windows Advanced Policy uh, Audit Configuration. So this is really cool because this event will give us the service name, uh, and only, and also the, uh, the actual image path of the, of the, uh, binary that's been executed. So on the left side, you see PSXEC with the name and then actually the PSXEC service. And on the right side, you see Metasploit. See how it has like, uh, first of all, has always has a weird service name. And then because it's using that one liner PowerShell, it's also going to have the entire PowerShell command here. So you can actually use this to basically for the code and see what happened or what kind of shell code it was used, right? Was used. So this is a really, really reliable event. The next really reliable event is object access. And this 4698 it will get logged when the scheduled task is created, right? And this will give you interesting fields, such as the task name. Uh, and also, on an XML within the event, the command and then the arguments. So that's interesting. For those this, these two type of events, we get the entire command line. So that's pretty cool. And we'll use that later on, on the tool. OK. Um, next. So WMI activity. So there is an event log for WMI, and there's three types of events. One, two, three, and that makes it easy. Uh, but the one that you're looking for is number, uh, uh, event two, which has the actual event. And on, when you're using WMI and you're abusing this win32 underscore, uh, process class, you'll see that on the event. So this is, you, you can see here how it actually references the win32 underscore process create. Unfortunately, this event won't give us any information about the process that was executed, the, at least this event, right? Unlike the other two that you get the full image path, this, is, this won't give you. However, we can use another event ID, it's just process tracking, right? It's just a, a Windows event that gets logged uh, when process gets in, get uh, instantiated. That's a 4688. And this is where we start to see a really interesting pattern with WMI, which is on WMI, when you're doing remote ladder movement with WMI, you always see this process being spawned. WMI uh, PRVSE.exe. And that guy will spawn your malicious process. In this case, I just run IP config, but you know, you could be whatever malicious you're trying to do, right? So I went on my EDR, the uh, endpoint detection and response uh, tool, where I actually have like 1 billion process events approximately. Uh, and I look for child processes of WMI PRVSE, and I only got 200 results. So out of 1 billion, 200, that's definitely interesting. Uh, and then I look for when PowerShell gets spawned by this guy or when CMD gets spawned by this guy, and there are always malicious events from a pen test that we did, right? So I think this is a really, really reliable way of hunting for lateral movement uh, using event logs and WMI or processes and WMI by looking for, uh, for child processes of this guy. Um, if you use uh, Matt Nelson's technique of uh, using this uh, MMC20 object, um, com object, you'll see some interesting behavior. You'll see that MMC will spawn your malicious process. In this case, notepad.exe. So once again, I went to me, uh, my EDR and looked for all the child processes of MMC20 
And I found like 400 events, but all of those 400 events were actually MMC itself. So MMC calling MMC. So I took that out, I filtered out where the child process is MMC, and I got zero events. So that means this is a really good reliable way of also hunting for lateral movement for the MMC com object technique. Unfortunately, for the other com, the two com objects, there's nothing that I could see, at least on event logs, that could uh, allow you to find a pattern, nothing. So, so far, based on the techniques that I've used, this is the most healthy way of doing it, ladder movement. I couldn't see it. All right, WinRM um, has a couple of logs also. To be honest, I, I haven't yet figured out exactly what's the best way of um, time, 25, okay. I haven't figured out a best way of how to look for a lot of movement on, on the actual event logs. Um, you'll see user authentication, but that only means that WinRM is being used, or you'll see an API call, but nothing that would detect actual lot of movement. However, there's an interesting pattern on the processes. So when I use, when you're using WinRM and like the WinR, like the WinRS tool or the Metasploit uh, module for WinRM, you always see Win, WinRS host.exe spawning your malicious process. Always. That's interesting. So I looked on my environment for that, for that, um, for that pattern and I got zero events back. So I think this is a really reliable way of looking for, um, lateral movement with WinRM, um, by looking at child processes of these guys. Now, on the other side, if you are using PowerShell remoting, you'll see another process. Uh, the WSM prop host.exe, and that guy will spawn uh, the malicious process. So, unfortunately, in my environment, because these admins use um, PowerShell remoting a lot, then this gives me a lot of uh, a lot of results. So, I still need to figure out exactly what's the best way to filter things. But maybe if your environments are not using uh, WinRM, then this could be a good one. Or maybe on your co uh, workstation, like. Windows 7, when you're not, when, where you're not using WinRM, this could be an interesting way of hunting. This is just how the events look like. Well, I'm gonna skip this. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the tool, right? So now I did this analysis of, I wanted to know the techniques that are out there, I wanted to know how they look like, and then I wanted to write a tool. So this tool is called Oriana. So when I first got that Dave, uh, uh, the, I actually want to stay here. So when I first got that email, was saying like your derby talk, uh, derby con talk was accepted. I was like happy, but also freaking out. I was like, okay, so what am I going to do now? It's, I, I had done the research of how these events look like and, you know, the types of wave, but I actually wanted to present something, you know, tangible that I could release and have, hopefully have people use in their hunts. This is, I decided I wanted to create a tool. First of all, let's talk about, this is a threat hunting tool. So threat hunting has been, you know, people are talking about threat hunting a couple of, um, it's, I don't know how long, but it's kind of a new concept, at least for me, no more than three or four years. But basically for us, what a threat hunting means, it means um, not waiting for an alert, just going out to your environment proactively and looking for bad stuff. So you are no longer waiting for an alert from your SIM or your whatever tool that you may have. You're going out there, digging through information and, aren't with knowledge of how offensive uh, is done, use that to create analytics to detect bad stuff. And usually start with, with an hypothesis. Uh, and then you develop the hunt, you examine the results, you're definitely gonna get some false positives, you refine, and then you do this hunt again, right? So this is, this is what Oriana will do. So for this first version, first version, I wanted to, you know, start simple. So I wanted to focus on uh, using Windows event logs, like I said, and I, I right now I actually focus on only four events, and you'll see how interesting, uh, how much information we can get only from four events. So, which is the authentication event, service creation, create a schedule task, and then the WMI event two event. Um, I wanted to, to provide visibility. Sometimes when you're go when you're going on a hunt, sometimes a hunt can be just a simple question. Uh, an interesting question to uh, to ask to your environment. And I wanted Oriana to allow me to ask simple questions that may have interesting findings, responses. Uh, of course, I wanted the tool not only provide civility, but also to you know point out potential lateral movement events. And I can do three right now: WMI services and tasks, and we'll get we'll do more hopefully as we you know work on these two more. I also wanted the tool to uh, to allow me to pivot through data. Once you're in a hunt. 
you usually, you know, you find a lead and then you go back to another lead and then you go back and you, you want to tie things together. It's not, so if I write a tool that's a command line tool that just, you run an analytic, analytics, it gives you a response, then you don't, cannot really go back to another data point. So that's why I wanted the tool to be a web tool. So I, I built a web tool. And this is the process for Ariana. You first, uh, export, uh, index data. You analyze and then you hunt. So let's quickly talk about that. So export. Um, so one PowerShell script that I've uh, took me a while to do because I, I don't know PowerShell, but uh, basically it uses two commandlets: get win event and export CSV. So basically it grabs those four events that I was telling you about, um, puts them into a CSV, and uh, we basically get one CSV per host, right? And it's only like 100 kilobytes. And now you cannot just call get win event and then export CSV that object. You need to do some, um, some processing on that object because, um, by default, it won't, it won't give you all the fields of the event. Like, for example, logon type or user IP. But I found online that you could do it with a for loop and XML and then you get the point. So we get one CSV per host. Now, also one interesting thing is like, if you go to event viewer and filter by 4624, the event ID, you'll see a lot of events that are just noise. The system account, the, uh, the account, the computer account. So I wanted to filter that out initially through PowerShell and just a couple of ifs to filter that out so I don't have to index that noise because it's just noise. I want to focus on actual users. And then, like I said, you get one CSV per host in uh, no more than a 100K or 150K uh, kilobytes. So, you know, you get, you get the point. It's really, it's almost nothing. And going back at least a couple of months. All right. Then this is the index piece. So I'm using P Python and MB, and an MBC framework called Django. And so this is, we have a relational database, right? So this is kind of how I define the schema. You have a, a host and a user, and then they're both connected to each other with an authentication event. Uh, you have the service creation event, 7045, and then the 4690, which is a, a scheduled task, um, event. They point to a service and a task, so I can, you know, make it more modular. And then finally, WMI event by itself. Now, this looks simple, but i there's a lot of things that we can do only with these things, and I'll show you. All right. So let's, we'll do, we'll jump to the first demo. And I wanted the tool to provide visibility, like I said. So I wanted to have like a, a detailed view for hosts, so you can see what a host has been up to, or a user has been up to, or a service. Some, some details, and you can ask questions to Oriana. I wanted to do basic, so I did basic calculations, like, and interesting things, like, what is an, a unique number of hosts a user has authenticated to locally? Or the unique number of hosts a user has authenticated to remotely? This could be interesting. And same for the host. So we'll, we'll just run, uh, jump to the demo. I have to say though, uh, when I was thinking about doing this demo, I, um, I was thinking, if I'm gonna just move laterally on a fake environment with five hosts and present this to you, it's just, just not gonna be compelling, right? So I actually did a real hunt on my environment and this is real data. So we're actually going to do a hunt using Oriana with real data and something cool with a real pen test that happened during this time. And we're actually going to hunt for a lot of movement on, on, um, using this tool, like I said, on a real environment. Of course, I've obfuscated all the data so you won't see users or computer names or IP address. So they won't make sense. But just, you know, remember, this is real data. So like I'm talking about 3,000 3, hosts, 3,000 users, 1.5 million authentication events, 60,000 service creation events. You get the point, right? So this is all real data from real hosts, from a real environment, from real users. On top of that, there was a pen test going on. Uh, so I did, so, you know, on the, when, when you call PowerShell, uh, for, for getting the event log, you can put the max results. So I did 10,000 and that took me about like two months. Yep. And by the way, uh, to ingest all the data for 3,000 hosts, it took like 1.5 hours. And to run the analytics, it took like eight minutes. So in, in a couple of hours, you can run this hunt, right? All right. So enough. Oops. Oh. No bueno. Sorry about that. Ooh. Come on. Okay. All right. So this is Ariana. So let's let's go. We're gonna do the visibility piece first, right? So. 
I want to look for hosts, and here's what I have. So for each host, I have, you know, as you can see, I have 3,000 hosts, right? So I did some basic calculations, and this is a cool question. So, hey, Oriana, show me then the host name that has the most amount of remote users. So meaning the most remote users have connected to this host. So I can do this with just two clicks. One, two. So this could start an easy response process, right? Hey, why is this, this host have 88 remote users connecting to it, right? Uh, you can do the same for local users, for example. Hey, why is this local, uh, why is this host have 37 local users? And of course, conference rooms and kiosks, things like that, right? But, you know, you get to ask some interesting questions, right? Now, if you're per curious about a particular host, you can just click on it and it's going to give you the local users that connected to it uniquely, the remote users, and then the remote authentication events, and the local authentication events. So now I can have a, a really interesting picture of a host and you know who's connected to it, right? So this is simple. Uh, uh, and like I said, you know, this is all pivot pivotable. I don't know if that's a word, but I can just click on a user. And, hey, this user looks weird. Why is he connected? So you can click on the user. And you'll get that user's information. Once again, this is the user view. So now you, you now get the host that he has connected to locally. Again, I do this local and remote thing based on the 4624 event and the type of event, right? Logon type three or 10. All the other ones are local. So remote host and then the, the authentication events. All right. That's simple, Mauricio. Show, show us something more cool. Okay. All right. So the user's view. So let me ask this simple question to Oriana. So, Who's the user who's connecting to the most hosts remotely? Right? So two clicks. One, two. Why is this guy connecting to 2300 hosts? Right? So you can click on this user and it will get you to the user profile and you'll see all the remote hosts that he connected to. What's up with that? Right? And you can get the authentication events also to kind of like see a picture of when this happened. And as you can see, most of the events happens on August 31st. Now, this would probably start an, an incident response investigation on your environment, and I'm just going to fast forward. And hold on, I need to charge my computer. <laughs> uh, do we have uh, an outlet somewhere? Oh, the piano. No, it won't. It's not that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Okay, so, um, is it gonna get here? Just a stick here. I want this to die. Oh, there you go. We did it. Thank you. All right. Cool. We didn't die. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right. So, so if you're a pen test, you probably know this. Once you get a shell, what is the first thing that you're gonna do? See if that that a user that you're running a command as has privileges privileges on other hosts. You want to know if you're a local admin somewhere else. So if you think about it from a Metasploit perspective, you may want to run the SMB login script. If you think about it from PowerSploit, you want to run like the find local admin module, or you can use just net use in a bad script, right? So this is exactly what happened here. The pen testers somehow got this username and they wanted to see if they were a local admin across the environment. And this is why they authenticated to 3000 hosts in less than 30 minutes. So boom, Oriana is showing me something interesting. Now let's get to even something more interesting. And you know what? So you know how when red team does, um, presentations, when, when they get a shell, people clap and cheer. I think, I think what we should do is like, if we find a lot of movement, we, we need to do something, right? See what I did there? <laughs> all, right, all right, so no, no, not yet, not yet. I'm trying to show you more cool stuff. All right, so I'm going to go to the services page. All right, so I get all the unique services that are in my environment, like 900. I can click around, and right away I find something interesting on the third page. What is this? And I just click on it. And this is someone moving laterally with PowerShell. Right? So now that I've learned this, I'm like, okay, now let me ask, let me ask Oriana a cool question, which is, who else is writing PowerShell on a service? Once again, I found 12 lateral movement events from a real, again, real pen test, real data. This works. Right? Uh, and this is where we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
that's it. <laughs> okay. So, and then, of course, if you know, like, offensive techniques, then you, you, you know, hey, who's running from the, uh, an admin chair? And this is Cobalt Strike. The pen testers were moving laterally. Rocky's uh, laughing. Yeah, you were moving laterally with Cobalt Strike. Uh, or you can do, uh, again, any administrative chair. You get the point, right? You can rule whatever you want here, right? So, uh, let's jump to the, to the next demo so I have uh, time here. And this, I promise, this is where it gets even cooler. All right, so we did the first demo, and I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to implement detection of lateral movement. And I wanted to ba start with something really basic. So I wanted to do, if I see a 46, 46, 24 event, which is authentication, followed by a service creation or scheduled task or WMI event within 30 to 40 seconds, because that based on my testing, I've seen it at this take at least 40 seconds to create a service event event. So I wanted to start with the simplest thing, right? Just Take a look at it from a time perspective. Authentication event type three, of course, and then service creation or schedule task or WMI event, and we'll see the results in a little bit. Uh, frequency analysis is a technique used for threat hunting a lot. It allows you to detect uh, uh, outliers, and I use that a lot, heavily on the tool, as you'll see. And finally, you know how when, when I tested the tools, I noticed that the service names um, that um, that were created by Metasploit and all these tools, they were always random, right? And even the workstation name sometimes. So I wanted a way to detect this randomness. And I took a look at regular expressions, but I, I moved away from that because I think regular expressions are first based on a sample. So you would do that one for Metasploit, one for Cobalt Strike, one from all the tools. So I don't want to do that. Also, they don't have context. They lack the context. So I was talking to one of our colleagues, Nelson, who's like a really sharp guy um, back at work uh, who likes data science and analytics and stuff like that. So he came up, he came up with a simple uh, algorithm that uses frequency analysis. And we he called it the Ngram score. Really simple. Basically, we grab all the service names. We have the first two letters of the service name and then count the number of times that those two letters appear on all the other service names. And then you co you uh, create a matrix of these weights. So if that's a, on the middle, you'll see the, the, the Python script, and this is what we get, like a matrix of two letters and then the weight, right? So now we are doing frequency analysis on, on two letters across all the services. Then we can uh, we can calculate a score of a particular uh, service name based on this, right? Um, so all right, demo number two, and this is going to get cooler, guys, I promise. <laughs> All right, so this is the possible lateral movement events. So I only have 38 possible lateral movement events. So out of 1.5 million events and 60,000 service creation events, that's not bad, right? That's a really, really low uh, number. So let's click on the first one. And I'm just going to click on the first one. As you can see, this was lateral movement. This was the victim. This was the user. Again, I can click on those to see who they are, right? This was the command line executed. In this case, it was a service creation event. And you can see that the authentication event happened at this time. And then 30, what, 20 seconds later, a service was created, right? So once again, we found a lot of movement on that first click, right? Now, um, interesting to know that, you know, pen testers are working late that day. Uh, okay, so I can just, you know, all these tables like jQuery, uh, just sortable. So I can start looking, seeing a pattern. What's the pattern? There's one user that seems to have been doing all the lateral movement, right? This user is probably compromised, right? And I just you can just click on this once again. This user, uh, this uh, lateral move potential lateral movement event. Once again, this is Cobalt Strike. So most of these events are actually for lateral movement. Yes, I have to say there are some false positives. Yes. But most of them are actually malicious events. So I wanted to, and then you can sort by the type, right? So this is WMI, for example, or scheduled task, right? Those three types. I wanted to take this further, and then I real, uh, and I figure, so when an, when an attacker is doing lateral movement, um, they're not going to just do one host, right? They probably, once they get the credentials, they're going to move out to one, maybe two, three, ten, whatever, right? And that's going to be, so I was thinking, huh, I can group these possible lateral movement events based on time, an interval of time, right? And this is what I call the lateral movement session. So out of the 38 events, only 16 sessions. 
So let me sort by the, the lateral movement session that has the most. So this has seven. So let's click on this. And this happened on August 31st from 10.07 a.m. to 11.59 a.m., so almost one hour and 52 seconds of that session. I click on it, and look at this nice timeline. So at 10.07 a.m., this computer got popped with a malicious service. A few, uh, actually one hour and 20 minutes later, at 11.35, this guy got popped. You get the point, right? This guy, this guy, this guy. So this is, and then when I, when I, when I, when I, the pen testers were like, yeah, we did something. I'm like, is this what you did? It's like, yeah, that's, that's what I did. <laughs> we knew, we, we, we knew what happened. That was awesome. That was that awesome to be able to show them this is what you did, right? Yep. That's what I did. Uh, I actually wanted to, you know, talk to our boss and figure out, hey, these guys, are uh, they, um, they move laterally around for like, see, like almost four hours. So it's like, is that right? Are we paying them for these hours or not? <laughs> uh, um, you get the point, right? So, all right. So I can just click on this other session and then of 10 events. And you can see a nice timeline of all the lateral movement events that happen during this time. PowerShell, Cobalt Strike, WMI, name it. All right. So now let's go to frequency analysis. So binary path. So service creation events have a path of a binary path. A scheduled task events also have the path. So I put them together and do fre did frequency analysis. Uh, so I can sort by the number of times. So these guys, these guys happen the most. So it's probably they're not malicious because if they're happening on my environment a lot, it means that they're part of my build or something, right? But what about the guys that are only happen once? What's up with those? Right away, we can see this bad guy, right? And you get the point. We'll see more bad guys as we, as we click around. Uh, Another simple one that I wanted to do, three minutes, two minutes. Another simple one that I wanted to do is the number of characters. So I want to sort by the most number of characters. So I can sort all these guys are malicious. Right? PowerShell, PowerShell, PowerShell. All right. The n-gram analysis. So service name, once again, I can do based on count. So this, why this only happened once on my environment? And this is bad, by the way, and you can find more about stuff. But this is the engram score I was telling you about to detect randomness of a string. So the lower the score, the, high, the higher the chances that this is random. So let's see if this works. It actually works. So I knew this, but I didn't. <laughs> um, all, these, all these services are, are malicious. And by the way, this is Cobalt Strike. This is how, I guess this is how they, they do it. And you can click on it and you can see, yep, this is when it happened to this host, to this, this user, this time, right? So you get all that forensic, forensic information um, that you want to get. I, again, we can do the same. And then one last one, one last question that I wanted to ask Koreana is, this is an interesting one, which user is using the most RDP, right? How easy is it for you guys to respond that? With Oriana, two clicks, one, two. So this guy, why is this guy RDP into 11 hosts, right? You may want to know about that. And you, you can just click on it. And you'll see exactly when and, and where he connected, right? So that was the demo. I hope you liked it, guys. I, I mean, it worked, right? I, in my environment, I was able to detect it. I, I, I claim this as success. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'm just going to finish with a really philosophical question. Uh, oh, future work before that. Future works. So I want to onboard more logs. Um, do more frequency analysis. If you have any ideas, send them over. I really want to implement that. I don't, I don't have the code yet on GitHub, uh, cause to be honest, I'm just ashamed of my code, cause it's, it just, <laughs> it's really brute force in everything. Uh, so I'm trying to clean things up and then I'll release it. Definitely make it open source for everyone to be able to download, use, and hopefully you'll be able to use it on your hands. <laughs> Thank you. And this was, the philosophical question that I wanted to leave you guys. And uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you.